Okay, we are talking with Anne Marie Slaughter here on the Goldstein on Gelt show. She is currently the president and CEO of New America. She actually kind of rose to fame in 2012 when she published an article called Why Women Still Can't Have It All in the Atlantic, and it became it very quickly became the most read article in the history of the magazine. And Maria, real pleasure to have you. I'm delighted to, to be here. So you talk about many topics, but a topic that I really want to touch on today is the question of equality and real equality. Can you give us a sense of what that really means? Well, I think that in the first place, that's exactly the right way to frame the debate about women, that it is, it is how do we get to real equality, full equality between men and women. And I think that actually involves changing the roles and choices open to men as much as it does to women. And real equality would mean that men and women have an equal chance to achieve their life potential to the extent that life circumstances allow, both as people who pursue their own goals and, and earn a living and can support themselves, and as people who define themselves in relationship to others as, as mothers or fathers or husbands or wives or sons or daughters or, or brothers or sisters. So there are these two sides of all of us. And, uh, you know, we used to say, well, men are about competing and earning a living and women are about caring and nurturing a family. And my point is both should have an equal chance to be both. Okay, so I, I, I certainly understand and, in fact, support that view. But you came to this in sort of a... Uh... Well, a surprising way, and I think a lot of people were surprised. Could you give us maybe the, the one or two minute summary of what led you up to that article and, uh, and to some of the, the, the ideas that you're speaking about now? Sure. So the first thing to say about the article is the title has gotten me into more trouble. <laughs> The title was Why Women Still Can't Have It All, by which I meant, here are the changes we still need to make if men and women are going to be equal. Uh, but it was read as women can never have both a career and be the parents or the children they want to be. Uh, so it, I wrote it because I... I uh, had always managed to have a really high-flying career and a fabulous family, including being the mother of two sons. But when I worked for Hillary Clinton in Washington, three and a half hours from my where my sons and husband lived in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, I had a great job and a great boss. But after two years, I encountered the kind of situation that many parents, uh, but it affects women more than men, encounter, which is, you know, I just had to make a choice. Uh, my, my son really needed both my husband and me full time on deck to get him through a difficult period. And there was no way to reconcile that. Uh, doing that with being a, a foreign policy professional and a very high-powered job. And so I realized I had to choose. And when I did realize that I had to choose, I realized that simply telling women, uh, you know, to lean in or to, uh, you know, devote themselves to their careers or to be ambitious just wasn't getting at the underlying trade-offs that, frankly, I think all caregivers have to make uh, or may have to make, but that affect women disproportionately. So I published that article, and then that led to, obviously, an enormous uh, pub amount of publicity, and then I've spent the last three years rethinking through this problem uh, and published a book called Unfinished Business, uh, Women, Men, Work, Family, just, just a couple of months ago. All right, so it's a, it's a great story, and it's fascinating, but as you're telling it, I can feel the glare of the eyes of all these women listening to the radio and saying, what's she saying? She's bringing us back 50 years saying, fine, women want to work great, but at the end of the day, when your husband and, and sons need you to raise them, you got to quit your you know, Washington <laughs> policy job and, uh, and race back home. What do you say to that? Uh, so in the first place, uh, yes, I feel those women too, and I, I, you know, I am a lifelong feminist. My entire life is devoted to the proposition that women should be able to achieve their full potential to the same extent men do. Uh, and so, what I would say about this is, first of all, 
we've come far enough and we need women in the workforce enough economically uh, as well as just in terms of tapping all of our talent that I don't think there's any danger that we're going to go backwards to women back in the kitchen. Uh, So that's the first point. The second is younger women already know that it's a lot harder than many of us have traditionally been willing to admit. Younger women have seen plenty of very, very talented mothers, sisters, and aunts uh, getting uh, shut out of the workforce when they had to make these choices. Uh, And unless we tackle that, unless we tackle the fact that for 20 years, at least in the United States, we have, we're, we're at most 15% or maybe 20% women in top jobs, even though we have over 50% women coming out of professional schools. So we're stuck. Younger women know there's a problem. I'm saying let's grab hold of that problem and be honest about it, and then let's fix it. Uh, And so what I would then say is the problem is exactly that when that tension between work and family happens, let's not pretend it doesn't happen. It does happen. And it happens particularly for women who are at the bottom of the income scale, much less for privileged women like me. But when that happens, why is it that we expect women to make that trade-off? Why don't we expect men to make that trade-off? Why don't we just say, all people who are workers and caregivers are going to probably face some difficult periods as they fit those together. And why don't we reinvent our workforce and our working conditions to make that possible, not only for women, but for men? We're talking with Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the president of New America and published a, what seems like a rather controversial article, uh, Why Women Still Count can't have it all, and now has come out with a new book explaining a little bit more about the article. And I, I want to dive into this because I, I, I'm sure that many people like to challenge you on the questions, but earlier you said that, in fact, you used the phrase women more than men, and to me, what I heard was, you know, when it comes to the family, at the end of the day, the woman might have to leave her job, as you did, instead of having your husband and sons move down to you. So you made the decision to, to leave, and it seems to me as though maybe one of the reasons that women aren't getting the top jobs, as you pointed out, you know, they, you said 15 to 20 percent of the top jobs, the, even though they have 50 percent of the, <laughs> of the uh, population of the planet, it's simply because there's, as you had said, they are more likely to end up having to go back home to take care of the family. And so for a business to say, listen, we can't invest as much in someone who's only going to be here for a couple of years, what would you expect? Yeah, so uh, that's exactly what I want to take on. I mean, I want I want to say that if we want to get to equality, we're going to have to have a revolution as dramatic uh, in the, in men's roles as we've had in women's roles. So maybe because define that for me. I, let's 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 cut to the chase. So maybe, okay, just, so that's a, was, that's the the unfinished business of the women's movement, which is why the book's called the Unfinished Business. Is that we have to do two things. We have to value caregiving as much as we value breadwinning. So right now, at least in the United States, if you earn a living, you are respected. If you take care of others for a living, whether for pay and it's low pay or not for pay, you get much less respect. So step one, you have to say that the work of investing in children or indeed in your own parents when you have, time comes to take care of them or a ill spouse or any disabled member of your family, that work of investing in others is as important as founding a startup or managing money or being a professor. So I'm inclined to agree with you. In fact, I I very much do agree with you on that point. But you can't just tell people to think that. Obviously, some people are not thinking it because they don't respect their their mothers and the work that they, they, the, the 20 hours a day they spent raising them. So how would you explain to people that, hey, this is a really important job? Well, so first place, I mean, you have to you have to tell them, even if they don't listen. I mean, if you think about how we've changed th- uh, thinking around smoking or same-sex marriage, we started by talking about it. But the second is, I would say, you know, particularly for an Israeli audience, but equally from an American audience, this is a national security issue, 
Right? We now know that raising children in the first five years of a child's life, you're not just teaching that child specific knowledge. You are shaping his or her brain for the rest of, of their lives. So that, that first five years determines what that child will be able to learn, how whether that child will be able to achieve his or her potential for the rest of their lives. And ma- maximizing that investment is a matter of economic competitiveness and military security. And indeed, in the book, I point out that the, the one place that really gets this in the United States is the Pentagon, uh, which absolutely pays its early childhood educators the same as it pays its secondary school educators uh, and is completely focused on on-site daycare and making sure that all the children of the people in the military have the very best investment in their futures. Um, so that's the, the first thing I would say is you, you, you make clear that unless we support and value investing in others, we're hurting ourselves as a nation. Uh, and we are, we are, so this work, as I said, it's just as important as anything we choose to pay for, and we should pay much more for it. But the second piece is this will never get respect as long as it's women's work. Right? We've liberated men, women to be like men, but we've said, and again, I'm going to speak to the United States because I don't want to presume to speak for Israel, uh, but we've said to the extent a woman does what her father traditionally did, she will be respected. So if she earns a living, she'll be respected. But if she does what her mother traditionally did, she won't be. And what I'm saying is, look, you've got to value women's traditional work and you've got to value it for men as well as for women, so, so that going forward, you know, if, if a child needs extra care or a parent needs extra care, the man in the couple, if it's a heterosexual couple, should be expected to take responsibility for raising children or caring for parents just as much as the woman should be. So just to be very clear, you're, you're, you're claiming that there's nothing biological that makes the woman somehow closer to the children or more the right person to be that, that as soon as the baby pops out, now it's 50-50? Yes, I am absolutely saying <laughs> okay. that. And I'm saying that, um, and, and you know, people laugh, but 50 years ago, if you'd said a woman is every bit as capable of earning a living as a man and is just as competitive as a man and can, uh, you know, wants to achieve her own goals just as much as a man, people would have laughed. People have said, no, 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 women are nurturing, you know, they're not competitive, they want to be home. Well, my lifetime has shown that large numbers of women, not maybe not every woman, but large numbers of women are just as competitive as men. And I would say what makes the difference with children is not biology, it's time. And so, you know, for single fathers, and there are plenty of single fathers, they raise children just as well as mothers do. I don't see how you could say that a child, ideally, I think a child should have multiple adults who love him or her in their lives. But I don't think you could say that a man who's raised a child has, has, is biologically less capable of, uh, than a woman. Uh, And I'd also say in my own experience, watching men who invest in their children right after those children are born, become just as competent as mothers. It's not like mothers have some biological magic manual to know how to do it. We figure it out. Well, a man can figure it out in the same way, just as in the workplace, men aren't biologically better at knowing how to run a business or, for that matter, fight a war. They figure it out, and women can figure it out, too. All right, so we will have to see how this how this goes, and I certainly think people should be following your book. Uh, Emery, we're just about out of time now, but tell us in the last few seconds, how can people follow your writing, follow your book, mm-hmm. and, uh, and keep up with you? Well, so uh, Unfinished Business is available on Amazon, uh, and there's a website for it. Uh, I would encourage people to follow me on Twitter. I'm at Slaughter AM, and I curate foreign policy, work and life, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, material on technology. Uh, and I also have my own website, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, or you can follow me on the New America website. So plenty of ways uh, to tap in. And I, I think it's, 
you know, you may disagree with me violently, but we need to have this debate. Oh, I'm a big fan of debate, and I'm a big fan of discussion, regardless of what size people, what side people come in. Very, very important. <laughs> and therefore, I'll encourage, encourage everyone, and we will put links to all of those sites you said at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com, so they can follow all the work. And Marie Slaughter, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with Money Maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world. If you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.